Very rarely does a book series close out all of the open plot threads and answer every question. One could argue that if every question was answered and every storyline resolved, it might make for a less engaging story. This is all certainly true of the Wheel of Time. In today's video, we're going to be taking a look at six of the unanswered mysteries from the Wheel of Time series. Now, we'll break down what we don't know, some theories as to what may have happened, but I definitely also want to hear from what you think in the comments of the video. So join me as we dive into the unsolved mysteries of the Wheel of Time. <laughs> So before we dive into the mysteries of the Wheel of Time, let me first thank the video's sponsor, NordVPN. If you're a regular user of the internet, and I assume you are based on the fact you're watching a video on the internet right now, you should have a VPN service. Do you know that your internet service provider not only tracks every website that you go to, but it stores that data and it often sells it as well. A VPN protects your browsing data. It disguises you online so no one can track where you go, what you do. It provides a level of privacy as well keeping people from tracking your location and your movements. It can also protect you while you travel, while you're doing online banking, or anything sensitive on the web. Another perk is that you can watch streaming content from other countries that you can't get in your own. It's all super simple and it's a must. And the good news is, VPNs are cheap to get. The better news is that because you're one of my viewers, you're going to get it even cheaper. Click the link in the description of the video and you will get a massive discount on the already low monthly cost for NordVPN. They are already the number one VPN service in the world and I'm proud to partner with them as I've used them for a long time even before they were sponsored. Click on the link in the description of the video and get your discount. You will not regret it. Let's also hit the spoiler warning on the video. Today's video will carry a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers running all the way through A Memory of Light, the final book of the series. This video will be very spoiler heavy. Do not watch this unless you have finished all of the books or you want to be completely spoiled on the series. You have been warned. All right, kicking off the list, we have a mystery that starts in the very first chapter of the very first book, and it's never truly answered. We are told that Luce Theron Telamon sealed away the Dark One and the Thirteen Forsaken, locking them away until they escape their prison as the bonds weaken in the Third Age at the start of the story. But we literally see a Shamael interacting with Luz Theron seemingly right after he has sealed the boar on the Dark One's prison. He has literally just killed his family. They aren't skeletons, they're fresh corpses, so we know it hasn't been a long time and so Ashamael shows up and they're interacting but supposedly Luz Theron just sealed him away. We do find out later that Ashamael was behind the Trolloc Wars and corrupted Arthur Hawkwing but that he was only able to ever leave his prison every thousand years or so for a period of 40 years. While this is acknowledged and theorized by certain characters in the book, it is never explained. The explanation given in the books in the Companion is, is that Ashamael was only partially sealed. This is in contrast to Aganor and Balthamel, who were sealed too close to the edge of the boar, so they experienced passage of time. What isn't explained here is what it actually means to be partially sealed, how that's possible, for instance, or why it would have immediately let Ashamael out of the prison that Luz Theron just created. It's almost as if Ashamael was never sealed, but that raises the question as if why he didn't age for 3,000 years, and also why he disappeared in the middle of the Trolloc Wars while they were almost winning and why he disappeared after Arthur Hawkwing's death. None of that is truly explained and it is an unsolved mystery in the books. Another of the major mysteries in the Wheel of Time is the entity known as Mordeth. As I covered in one of my latest lore videos, Arid Hall was once a member of the Compact of the Ten Nations and a strong ally of Minethrin. However, a man named Mordeth entered the city at the height of the Trolloc Wars and began to advise the king of Eridhal. Eventually, Mordeth had the city and all of its residents suspicious of everyone else and each other, and they became ruthless and essentially became more evil to fight evil. The population eventually killed each other, and that hatred spawned Mashadar. Mordeth did not die, however. He continued to live in what would become Shadar Logoth for thousands of years, until eventually merging with Hot on Fane. For more information on Shadar Logoth, check out my recent video explaining everything we know about the rise of Eridhal in its descent into madness and becoming Shadar Logoth. But 
All of this begs the question, what is Mordeth? He clearly has some power beyond just being a human that convinces people to be suspicious of each other. Not only was he able to live for thousands of years, but what was his power that he held over people and how was he able to corrupt them? If you didn't know that he fought the Shadow, you might think that he was an agent of the Dark One, but he is clearly not, as he hates the Shadow as much as he hates everyone else. In fact, his hatred of the Shadow is one of the driving forces behind all of that corruption. So that brings us back to what the hell is Mordeth? Although completely unconfirmed, there is a going theory that Mordeth went to Sindhal, which is the land of the Finns during his time as the advisor to the king of Eredhal. Whatever he asked for there gave him the ability that he keeps, that's able to transform people, probably something to do with how to beat the shadow, and this is what the result was. This is plausible in the sense that the Finns are the only group that appear to have some control or weird abilities outside of the light and the dark one, but again, this is completely unconfirmed, and it makes more death a mystery still, even 10 years after the books were completed. So this is a question we never even get a smidge of an answer to throughout the series, and that is, of course, what is the Horn of Valir? Obviously, the horn is a horn with some writing on it, and it summons the heroes of the horn when blown, but what is it, where did it come from, and how does it work? Most of the magical items in the books have some tie to the main magic system of the Wheel of Time in channeling, but not only does the Horn of Valir not use the One Power as we know it, the heroes it calls are not channelers either. In fact, none of the heroes of the horn can channel. And while we don't get any specifics, it can be theorized that the horn is tied to Teleron Riyadh, as it calls back souls that we know from Brigida reside in the world of dreams while they're waiting to be reborn. Now this would also explain some of the weird happenings at Falma when the horn is blown and mist is around and Rand is fighting in the sky. That all feels very dreamlike. And so if the Horn of Valir essentially summons an area where the world of dreams combines with the real world, maybe that's what it does. But again, none of that is confirmed and we aren't given that much to go on making this one of the unsolved mysteries from the Wheel of Time. We also do not know when the Horn of Valir was created. It's assumed that it was created prior to the Age of Legends because they had it, but it doesn't appear to be an object of the One Power. Maybe it was made at the same time as the Portal Stones? Who knows? But again, none of this is confirmed and we are not given much to go on, making this one of the unsolved mysteries of the Wheel of Time. One of the most asked questions from fans to Brandon Sanderson is this. Who is the old lady Nakomi that shows up a few times at the end of the series? And unfortunately, we will probably never get an answer from Brandon on this, as this is one of three questions that he is never allowed to answer. We'll address the other two questions in this video as well. But first, Nakomi shows up on Avienda's journey to Roydeon. They have some food together, they have some conversations, and after giving some advice to Avienda, she disappears without a trace, including all of the things she brought with her. We next sort of see her, it's assumed, when Rand is being carried out of Shea Ghul after sealing the boar at the last battle. Now this is a scene that was written by Robert Jordan before his death, so we also know that Nakomi is canon from Robert Jordan. This isn't a Sanderson creation. There are a number of theories though as to who she is. I covered this in detail in a video I made if you want to go back and watch that in much more depth. Apologies up front as it is one of my earliest videos and I would say at best the production quality is pretty garbage at best but enjoy that but to summarize Nakomi is theorized to either be a representation of the creator or a female version of the dragon reborn from the past not the dragon but another version of the chosen one for the light from a different age it's never confirmed and I don't know if we will ever really truly get an answer but Nakomi remains one of the biggest unsolved mysteries from the series and a fan favorite to talk about So how did Rand swap bodies with Moradin at the end of the last battle? This is another question Brandon Sanderson gets asked often, and it's one that he is not allowed to answer. So at the end of the last battle, Rand ends up swapping consciousnesses with Moradin and assuming Moradin's body as his own body dies. Now while the world thinks that Rand Althor has died, the reality is, is that he has lived on in Moradin's body, and men, Avienda, and Elaine all know it. So how did this happen? It's never explained, and it likely never will be, but we do have some theories as to how it happened. Both Rand and Moradin had a connection that neither of them truly understood that started in the events of A Crown of Swords. In fighting Samael and Mashadar, they both used Balefire and crossed streams. There's something very important I forgot to tell you. What? 
Don't cross the streams. Moradin was using the true power and Rand the one power, but in that moment their streams of Balefire crossed, they began to see through one another's eyes and pull each other into each other's dreams. Neither of them truly seemed to understand the connection. Apparently though at some point Rand figured it out probably once he joined with Luz Theron fully. It seems to have been something that he anticipated happening as he had Olivia prepare for it, to give him gold and a horse and all that when he left, and they knew Kalindor was a trap for Moradin that would allow Rand to seal the boar. The soul swap clearly has something to do with the nature of the way Rand was able to control Moradin's channeling through Kalindor, but it is not explained and we are left to simply theorize on another unsolved mystery. Lastly, one of the most speculated upon events in the books, Rand lighting the pipe without using the one power. How the heck did he do it? Well, this is the final of the three questions that Brandon Sanderson is not allowed to answer. And while there are many theories, we just don't know for sure. After Rand's physical body dies and Rand in Moradin's body begins to sneak off, he tries to draw upon Sidene to light his pipe and he finds that he can no longer channel. However, he essentially just thinks the pipe is a light and boom, there it is. And boom goes the dynamite. So how can Rand do this without being able to channel? Well, one of the main theories is that Rand has some control over the pattern now, as he existed outside the pattern for a time in his fight with the Dark One. He was able to manipulate the strings of reality, and it appears that he, to some degree, at least retains this ability. This is similar to what Nakomi appeared to be able to do as well when she summoned all this stuff and then disappeared, which is why it's speculated by the way that she's a version of the female dragon or something like that. But what do you guys think? Is Rand able to control the pattern now? Let me know in the comments of the video, along with letting me know what you think of the other unanswered questions on this list. Do you think there's a good answer to any of these that I didn't mention? What are your theories? Let me know in the comments comments of the video. Make sure to check out my latest news video to find the weekly contest where I'm giving away a Tarval and Harbor Master t-shirt. I explain how to enter that contest in that video, so go watch that. Make sure to also like this video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. If you enjoy what I do, please consider supporting me on Patreon as that helps keep me making videos like this and your support is beyond appreciated. The only real videos that provide a ton of views to the channel right now are the news videos. If you like this lore related content, please consider supporting me on Patreon so I can feel inclined to make more of them. Don't forget to check out NordVPN in the description of the video as well. Thank you all for watching and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. Mistress up above, slipping on the rope of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free. Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?